it seems like the 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 best way to to really endorse the the, the scientific view the or, or a, it doesn't even have to be a scientific view just a more accurate view is to get more practice using it um the reason why we'll we'll often default to intuitive theory so the it was there first um and we just uh um are it, it's the first theory or idea that comes to mind it's the most easily deployed it's also uh, potentially connected more strongly to the environment in which we live that was Andrew Stuhlman, Harvard alum and chair of the psychology department, Occidental College, as well as author of Science Blind, which addresses what he calls intuitive theories. Now, these are theories we create as children about the world around us to help us define how it works and how we interact with it. Hello, I'm your host, Martin John, The Recovery Mentor, and I want to welcome you to the Recover Yourself podcast, where we address topics you'll face while on a journey to recovering yourself. This podcast is all about expanding the definition and scope of addiction and recovery so everyone has the opportunity to recover themselves. That way, no matter where you are on that journey, there is a place for you here. What you're gonna see today is that we create intuitive theories before we understand the world. Some of these are even created before we can talk. Once we learn that we're making theories like this, it shouldn't be a surprise that those are often at odds with scientific theories or the realities of things at play. This conversation touches at the root of my teaching around perceptions and our reactions when our brains engage in the salient network, more commonly known as fight or flight. When it comes to understanding the world, so much of our ideas lie under the surface of our awareness. We have deep subconscious relationships with early perceptions, or as we'll address today, intuitive theories. Most of these were created before we really understood anything about the world. When we got burned reaching for a flame or a pot, we made assumptions about heat. When we saw things fall, we made assumptions about gravity and space. When we witnessed relationships, we made assumptions about what they were and how we should act within them. This conversation with Andrew shows that these ideas don't simply go away. We have to add deep awareness to their existence, which is hard enough, but once we can do that, we will have to get increasingly practiced at not engaging those intuitive theories if we don't want to live lives imprisoned by them. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to talk with you. <laughs> and you too. So you, uh, I just finished a couple of weeks ago Science Blind, and I was really excited to uh, chat with you about what happens to us as children in terms of developing our um, our perceptions in our lives? Can you give us a little brief on, on what Science Blind kind of covers and what are some of the things that you understand about perception in children and how adults process what they perceived as children? Sure. So um, Science Blind is all about intuitive theories. Um, these are theories of the world that we construct on our own. Um, so that's where the intuitive label comes from, uh, as opposed to scientific theories that you would learn in the course of formal education. Uh, and intuitive theories, um, we construct them because we need to understand the world around us. Um, you know, from, from the moment we're born, we're surrounded by all kinds of phenomena, natural phenomena of a physical nature or a biological nature. And we don't just wait until we get to school to try to figure it out. We construct our own understanding. And uh, by the time you enter school, you've pretty much constructed uh, explanations for um, the fundamental areas that you will be taught about. So you have theories of, of motion, of heat, of uh, life and death, of growth, inheritance. Um, and these theories are in place um, uh, just to help you understand what's what's going on around you. Objects are moving around you. You know, heat is changing around you. Uh, they're not uh, uh, necessarily elaborated or well articulated, um, and of course, they're they're often quite wrong because they are based on some innate ideas we hold coming into the world. Um, we have some expectations about what we're going to observe um, and then uh, you elaborate those expectations with first experience interacting in the world and then also will be cultural teachings um, and these intuitive theories uh, they get d developed and enriched so they that you know the more experience you have with the world and the more you hear you know people talk about the world 
but it's not as if what happens in the course of development and education is they slowly morph into scientific theories. Instead, intuitive theories actually have a kind of structure to them that is often uh, fundamentally opposed to scientific theories. Uh, there's the the way that scientists have carved up the world is to, is often so different in a given domain that. Um, you can't just uh, learn more and have your intuitive theory slowly change into a scientific one. Instead, you have to just put the intuitive theory aside and learn the scientific theory anew from scratch. And for a while, people thought that, you know, in that process, you overwrote the intuitive theory, you know, because it's not an accurate theory. It's a useful theory. It helps you out in daily life, but it, it doesn't really cut to the core of how the world really works. But it, it looks like we don't ever really get rid of our intuitive theories. We just construct scientific theories in addition to intuitive theories. Um, and that's only if there's an impetus to construct the scientific theory. A school is the primary impetus, but lots of people go through school without ever really learning how objects move or how evolution works. There's some scientific theories that people tend to, to acquire, like scientific theories of life and death and um, uh, thermodynamics like heat, but there's others where most people actually never really learn the relevant science. But even in cases where you do learn the relevant science, you never give up on your intuitive theory. And those theories will come to the fore in everyday situations where you never, you never learned in the classroom how to apply your scientific theory. So you just, uh, you default to the way you were thinking prior to education. They can also come to the fore when you're burdened in some way. So you're, there's a time pressure um, and it, it, take, it usually takes more time to access and reason with your scientific concepts. So you default to the earlier concepts that are more intuitive, more, more familiar. So what's interesting to me about like this idea of intuitive theories is like we create these as, as children and we go to school with this kind of concept of, all right, we're going to learn. And then we don't, right? Like, 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 like we hold on to so much of these false ideas and false constructs, let's say, of how the world works. And so what have you found in terms of like that reversion? Like if you have information and can't process that information in a situation because of a time constraint or a trigger or something. Right. So, uh, you know, there are many points of overlap between intuitive and scientific theories where they, they actually are in agreement uh, because, you know, your intuitive theories are not totally bizarre. Uh, they are sort of an approximation of what's going around around you, uh, but they have uh, flaws. They're either fundamentally incomplete in some area or they've, they've, they've carved up the world and in a way that just doesn't map onto reality as scientists know it. So um, it's those points of disconnect where the two, uh, you're in a situation where your intuitive theory and your scientific theory provide different explanations or different interpretations of what you're seeing or different predictions about what how the events are gonna unfold. What you need to do in that moment is step back and recognize, oh, actually the scientific view is the one that I should be working with. You know, that's the explanation I should endorse. That's the prediction I should follow. Um, but that takes uh, cognitive resources. I mean, the primary cognitive resource is inhibition. You have to be able to inhibit the intuitive theory in order to work with the scientific theory. And that, that inhibition can only happen if you're not burdened in some way. You know, the, the, the reason why the intuitive theory is the theory that wins out when you have two competing theories is because it's the one that's more familiar. It's the one that you started with and probably it's the one that you work with on a daily basis more often. It's, it's only sort of on the fringes, on um, the perimeter of understanding where the scientific theory is really needed to, uh, uh, to do uh, the work for you. Um, but the, the kinds of phenomena you experience on a daily basis are ones that your intuitive theory can account for. That's why you constructed the intuitive theory in the first place. It, it's, the, it's a default theory because it's more useful and it's probably more, more frequently accessed. Um, but that doesn't mean you know, that it, you can't overcome that theory. And uh, you know, part of what scientific training is all about in, in addition to just learning the science, learning the concepts and the theories um, is also learning a scientific mindset um, and recognizing the difference between just an intuition and a principled reasoned opinion. Uh, and, and also, you know, science has to proceed carefully with 
field level uh, inhibition, where we, we recognize as a field, oh, this is the way we used to think about uh, these things, but, but within this new framework, here's our new way of thinking about it. Yeah, so I, I mean, I can give you a good example of that, which I would is- I love that, yeah. Yeah, the uh, uh, intuitive theories of life versus scientific theories of life. Um, so, you know, kids um, are in communities around the world where they hear the adults talk about life and death, living, um, you know, not alive, those sorts of terms, and they try to understand what they mean. Um, because you can't um, observe the inner workings of an organism. I mean, life and death are all about whether the 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 bodily machine of an organism is is working appropriately or it has broken down so uh, since kids can't observe you know the true underpinnings of life they revert to motion instead things that move on their own in seemingly goal-directed ways that's what they take to be alive um, so they map those words life and death onto whether or not the thing is animate um, so it's this uh, theory that that gets labeled uh, animacy and uh, eventually you learn that actually there are things in the world that don't seem to be moving but are alive like plants and there are things that you can't even see that are alive like germs and then there's things that do see that do move on on their own that are not alive like the sun and the clouds so little kids will tell you like the sun is alive and they would deny that a flower is alive but eventually you learn you know that to be alive you have to have organs that are inter working in interrelated ways to keep the um, organism taking in energy. So they think about it. Eventually, you learn to think about life and death in metabolic terms. But there's many demonstrations now that you can take a, an adult who understands perfectly well that a plant is alive, and you put them in a situation where they have to classify things as living or not living as quickly as possible. And if you present names of animals and names of plants, they'll first of all make more errors for the plants. They'll more often say that a plant is not alive than to say that an animal is not alive. And then when they're correct, when they get the correct judgment that this plant is alive, it takes them longer to make that judgment than to judge an animal alive. So you know that indicates that there is some cognitive conflict there that it, for our whole life, we'll always think of plants as not quite alive because they don't move on their own. And we can recognize with our newfound scientific knowledge, actually, you know, that plant is alive, um, but it takes uh, the, the, the resources needed to inhibit the misconception that it's not alive because it's not moving on its own. And if you don't have those resources available, you won't inhibit that misconception and the misconception will rule the day. Wow. So this is this is this. I mean, this is perfect, right? Right in line with so much that um, that we talk about on this podcast. It's, you know, and and we also talk about this idea of resources. We talk about the idea of resources of you know, when you wake up, you have the most resources of willpower, like this idea that you can process what's going on around you and 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 present yourself properly within that situation um, at the beginning of the day. And then as your day goes on, you, you, if, if, if you have to, like, not have jelly on your toast or not have a jelly donut and for breakfast, then lunch, you're going to have a little less willpower. You know, like if you have to utilize a lot of willpower, a lot of your resources. And so this idea that, like, every time you're presented with something that you, you, uh, you, that, that is comfortable – Versus something that, oh, I had to learn this and I'm not comfortable because it's not something that I created or it's not something that, 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 that I've carried my whole life, right? Um, it's not this intuitive, easy sort of understanding that isn't real deep understanding. Mm -hmm. Like that comes up, right? Like this idea. Uh, and so I, I like the fact that you utilize that term like uh, your resources because they do they do dwindle during the day, <laughs> and especially like as soon as you get 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 a time constraint or something, you get you you have to deal with this. Yeah, so it, it, psychologists use the the phrase executive function, uh, and, and executive function is a whole suite of skills. Um, it includes working memory, so being able to hold information in mind, set shifting, moving between uh, information or sets of information, uh, because oftentimes, you know, to respond appropriately to the environment, you have multiple responses available to you, but you have to choose one response rather than another. Um, inhibition, uh, those, are, those are the core. Um, and 
uh, there's there's variation in executive function skills throughout your life. You know, some people just seem to have more than others. There's ways of training up executive function uh, to help people. Uh, I don't know if there, there's successful interventions for for just having more executive function forever, but at least in the moment to fine tune or uh, amplify executive function skills. One interesting finding with uh, with respect to competing theories of the world is that individuals with Alzheimer's disease um, oftentimes lose their executive function abilities as a result of dementia. And what ends up happening is they, uh, they lose uh, their grip on the scientific theories of the world they've constructed and they revert to the ones they constructed as children. Um, so if you ask someone with Alzheimer's disease, uh, to name some things that are alive. Um, they rarely name plants as alive. Uh, and then if you actually ask point blank, you know, is this flower alive? Is this tree alive? They'll say no. Um, and if you ask about things that move on their own, like the sun and the clouds, they'll say they are alive. Wow. Uh, and so they, it's not even time pressure with them. Um, you can, they just uh, have lost the ability to prioritize the scientific view uh, over the intuitive view. But it, there's some evidence that they haven't lost the scientific view because if you engage them in a conversation and say like, well, you just told me that the sun is alive, but, but does, does that mean the sun has babies? Does the sun have organs? And then they realize, no, it doesn't. And then they, they might change their mind, but they don't, um, they, they don't have the resources to step back and even recognize that the, uh, the theory that comes most naturally to them, the intuitive theory is the wrong theory. Mm. So many of our thoughts, especially like my audience that are coming out of addiction and other stuff, we, we have this, this kind of understanding of the world and things are right. And then we kind of like bed in with that camp. How can we challenge our thoughts, especially when uh, the beliefs we have are, are ones that we believe are right? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not necessarily that you believe that you're right. Uh, the intuitive theories are right. I, it's pretty easy to poke holes in them, right? It's like, mm -hmm. well, you know, you might have the gut instinct that a plant's not alive, but um, if you don't water it, it dies, right? It, um, and you can uh, show, you know, the plant actually does have uh, tissues and cells and just not like animals. So uh, it's, it's often the case, it's, it's not just about right or wrong, or um, it's just multiple ways of representing the world. And on one representation, plants are alive, and on another representation, they're not. Um, and it seems like the the, the best way to, to really endorse the, the, the scientific view, the, or, or a, it doesn't even have to be a scientific view, just a more accurate view is to get more practice using it. Um, the reason why we'll, we'll often default to the intuitive theory, so the intuitive was there first, um, and we just, uh, um, are, it, it's the first theory or idea that comes to mind. It's the most easily deployed. It's also uh, potentially connected more strongly to the environment in which we live. You know, our, our theory of life, for instance, is not going to be well connected to germs because we don't see germs, but it, it will be well connected to, say, people and animals because those are the things that are around us that we do see moving. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I guess it's, a, it's both a matter of practicing the, the theory, but it's also a matter of, um, of recognizing that the theory the, the scientific theory and the intuitive theory conflict and to, to use those uh, cognitive resources to help resolve the conflict. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about my own research, which doesn't have quite the positive spin you might be hoping for, which is that we've done many studies trying to get people to reason scientifically in situations where intuition and science conflict. And what we find again and again is that we can make people more accurate overall in terms of like, we'll give them a battery of questions that are counterintuitive in nature. So there's these questions are designed to elicit an intuitive response and a scientific response. And we can uh, prime them to think scientifically in terms of contextual cues like images. We can actually give them instruction and training on the, the relevant science. And overall, this boosts your accuracy on our test, but it doesn't change how quickly you respond to our items. That the conflict is always there. Every time you encounter a, um, uh, an idea that's uh, at the intersection of your theories, where intuition says one thing and science says another thing, 
uh, it doesn't seem like there's a way of, o of always privileging science, that the, both of your ideas arise. Um, you can just get better at suppressing the intuitive theory and going with the scientific theory. So um, it might be the case that professional scientists, say a, bo a, a botanist who is working with plants and has to fully realize that they're alive, they may be in an environment where now the, the idea that plants are alive is easily accessed and well practiced. But I think for the average person, if you're not, if you haven't constructed that kind of environment, you have to recognize there's always going to be conflict between your intuitive ideas and the and and more accurate ones. And so that would just then require more um, awareness within the moment versus being able to make a decision when you're under a kind of time constraint, when you're under a trigger, when you're doing this, like being cognizant of, oh, I'm making a decision that isn't giving me what I need to do to be able to make a good decision. Mm -hmm. like, like being able to just put yourself in a position to be like, well, let me step back from this. Let me kind of be able to um, process this in a better way. Um, when I talked about when I talk to people about like the, the the patterns that they work with and that they're working through, I always say, look, if you're going to get triggered and give the wrong answer, give the wrong answer. There's nothing wrong with giving a wrong answer, but go back and process when you when you don't have a time constraint, when you're not triggered, like go back and process why why you gave that answer. Don't defend it. Don't defend it outside of the realm of the time constraint. Right. Oh yeah, I think that's great uh, because. Um, I think there's probably, I don't know if this is true, but I think there's probably a lack of recognition that we hold multiple theories of the same phenomenon. So uh, you, I imagine the average person thinks they're, they're pretty consistent inside. They have one way of thinking about it and it's the right way of thinking about it. Um, but uh, actually, you know, if you analyze their pattern of responding, from one situation to the next, one day to the next, it's very inconsistent. It just depends on how um, the idea was was elicited, you know, the contextual cues or the task they're trying to solve, but it's actually pretty jumbled. Um, so a recognition that you there's internal inconsistency is important. And then beyond that, uh, a further recognition of the situations that will most likely elicit um, the the wrong views or the the views that you wouldn't personally endorse if you had time to reflect. I think that's the uh, the real crux about this issue of like, do people actually believe the misconceptions? Right. I think that it's it's a case where rather than to, to uh, go external to them and say science says this is correct and incorrect, rather I think a, a better metric is. Is this a view that you would endorse yourself if you had enough time to reflect on the situation? Um, and I think that's a better metric for, for determining whether or not that, that counts as like the correct representation or what they truly believe. Right, because that because because I, I I always have a little bit of a of, of a little every time somebody says like we can't change, right? Like I always sort of kind of like well we don't want to because like that takes work right and that burns calories and that does all of this thing but but um you know for me and the people that i work with and and, and how i talk about it, it's always just like well just admit that you can be wrong you know like it, it just on the on the surface just like with everything we have to admit we, we can be wrong because being right in our society here in the states at least is the um is everything from the moment we were born and wrong a lot. <laughs> well, right. And and the thing is, is is having those intuitive thoughts and solidifying them around the rightness that they are for us as children or whatever, like makes us feel more valuable because being right in our society is the thing that we value. Right. Yeah, it's it's an interesting quirk about how we reason about the world that we don't like to just be ambivalent about things we don't or, or we don't like to embrace ignorance uh, we uh, we come up with these ideas on our own and we we cling to those so we rather than in a situation say I just I don't know I don't know what the right answer is we we tend to think that it's the intuitive answer is the right answer or eventually you you learn of a new answer and now that's the right answer but um, there's many situations where it probably would be helpful 
education wise if we entered the classroom just embracing our ignorance um, mm. instead though we enter thinking we already know everything that's going to be taught and we have not you know we have a really a misconstrual of the the domain or the the situation uh, which actively conflicts with instruction <laughs> So much of an, another kind of point that I always make is like everything that you see just reflects what you've experienced. So when you go into a classroom already thinking, well, I understand this and, and I, have a, I have maybe a rudimentary idea of what you're going to be talking about. Maybe it's in physics or biology or whatever. I have this idea and all of these being <laughs> intuitive kind of concepts. Um, and then I go in and, and all of those were actually constructed by experiences that I personally had and nobody else could have had. You could have had, you could have gone to the, you know, Grand Canyon as well, but your experience would have been very different because of your environment, because of the people that were there, because of what you experienced, what you happened to hear and what you happened to not hear. Yeah. So yeah. all of those things are part of that. Continue. Uh, there's a... a a group of researchers uh, who work in this area who think that um, this contrast between an intuitive theory and a scientific theory um, you know, doesn't do justice to the intuitive theory. And some people call them naive theories, which further emphasizes the notion that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, and I, I think there, there's a grain of truth to this idea that you're, um, we are constructing uh, a representation of reality that honors a lot of true things in the world, um, that it, it does map on uh, reasonably well. Uh, and you don't want to tell students, you know, um, here in Physics 101, everything you know about motion is wrong. Throw it out the window. You have to learn this completely new view. Um, there's overlap between the way they already think about motion and the way they're going to learn to think about motion. And there are specific situations you can tap into and say, actually, your intuitive idea about, um, you know, how a ball bounces or the forces that a spring exerts on your hand, those are actually right. Those align with science. But your views about projectile motion, on the other hand, um, they're missing some fundamental pieces because you don't observe projectiles uh, in an unbiased way, right? You are either throwing the projectile or catching the projectile or it's passing you. But if you, you know, change your frame of reference, you'll see things that you didn't notice in the moment. So uh, it is a, a the, the process of, of teaching science in light of uh, non-scientific intuitions is challenging uh, because you you don't want to turn someone off by telling them they're all wrong because in fact they're not all wrong um, you have to figure out what pieces you can use and build off of and what pieces have to be highlighted as problematic and um, and discarded and, and not included in the new, in the, the new theory that you're constructing right and you talked about these three different aspects of like challenging the beliefs that are totally off base like like you're saying like projectile motions and other things like that and and you know for 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 my work it would kind of like go into like the relationships that you learned when you were a children you don't want to hold on to those you want to redefine what relationship means possibly because you had like poor poor models um uh, uh refining incorrect beliefs uh that idea of like oh you have a belief that mm, just needs a little tweaking let's go ahead and like 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 let's 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 fix the incorrectness of this like not everybody is out to get you not everybody not not all of these kind of processes um and then support and elaborate on like beliefs that are correct right like like you were saying, where it's just like, oh, this is right, but let's let's just add this little thing to it just so you can understand why uh, this is the case. Um, and by doing that, like in hindsight, again, like give the wrong answer, re like reframe it. And in hindsight, kind of like when you have that space, go ahead and um, and process that information. I wanted to ask you about presenting people data like like um, I, I've heard and, I, and, and it's, it's just a, a phrase that kind of kept popping up, this idea that you can't present people data and uh, like flat data as, as kind of like graphs and charts or whatever, but people love that kind of stuff. And so what is the conflict here? Um, because we're always, as we go through the world, collecting data and we're presenting it back to ourselves. Mm. Well, 
yeah, there's, there's kind of a disconnect here between the data that we're collecting on our own all the time and using to uh, enrich um, our, our views. I mean, it's sometimes revise them as well, but usually more. We're just, the observations we've taken are usually confirming <laughs> our expectations because uh, if they don't confirm them, we don't even... <laughs> we don't uh, notice them. They're not ours. They're, yeah. Um, but then there's, there's uh, data at an external level, like a, a group of people have collected this data and are presenting it to you. Um, and that's, it, it's challenging to understand for a variety of reasons. One is just we're not um, literate with how it's presented. Um, you know, a lot of people just don't, can't read graphs uh, or they can't read tables. Um, they don't, um, you know, they don't recognize uh, what, you know, what a, the, the patterns that um, a scientist or an economist or a mathematician, they, the, they'll look at a graph and immediately see patterns that the, um, the, the person who's not familiar with graphs doesn't see. Um, but beyond that, there's also um, this question of how do I take uh, this information that's being presented to me um, in this abstracted form and use it to inform my own experience of the world, um, you know, because those your your the expectations you have of the world have been shaped by data, but it's data that's been filtered through your personal observations, and so this is a very different kind of data, and it probably how most people process it is is um, in a very uh, restricted way, where you you form the belief, oh, this is actually how things work. Here's the data that that prove that, but then you don't um, fully uh, assimilate that new understanding into your prior understanding. So you're you have just you end up with a fractured view of what's going on. Um, you know, like it just in terms of that framework between intuitive theories and scientific theories, it's probably the case that when you are presented with data, uh, your scientific theories are responsive to the data, but your intuitive theories are not. I, there, there's also another problem with data, which is also just a motivational problem where some people just don't understand why it's important, why they need to attend to it, right? Like they prioritize their their own observations, their own life experiences over anything that um, could have been collected in a more systematic fashion or by other people who might have an agenda or, or whatnot. I, 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 don't, I don't know how you would even go about um, challenging the, the motivation side of it. I think that's its own piece. It's, it gets tied up in your identity and your politics, uh, your worldview. Uh, but if, you know, if motivational considerations aside, there's still cognitive problems in processing the data too. Right. We're always kind of laying our own understanding of things. It's an overlay because we can't not just because everything's getting processed in our mind. And so like our intuitive theories, even though maybe maybe as you know, like the botanist you mentioned doesn't believe that plants are not alive anymore. It's still back there somewhere because those things never go away, even though they shrivel up in terms of in terms of thoughts and stuff. They can they can pop back into life uh, pretty, pretty quickly because they're part of our experience. One fundamental difference between intuitive theories and scientific theories is that at their very or they they have a different way of analyzing the world. There's a there's a basic assumption that's being made, um, or a, a preconception that uh, ultimately uh, makes them qualitatively distinct rather than quantitatively distinct. So I mentioned that you can't take an intuitive theory and just enrich it, and eventually it will morph into a scientific theory. And that's because there's some something fundamental at its core that's not right. Um, so I think maybe a good example of this is in terms of um, learning the shape of the earth. Uh, so the uh, we all know that in adults living in Western industrialized societies that the earth is a sphere. Um, but children don't think of the earth as a sphere. They think of it as fundamentally flat because the ground is flat and gravity pulls things down to the ground. Um, and uh, you have to realize actually the ground isn't flat. It's only your perspective of the ground um, being on the earth and being able to see only a small chunk of the earth. And, and then the gravity part, you have to uh, realize that it's not a downward pulling force, but an inward pulling force and that it will pull things inward no matter what part of the sphere you're on. And until you've 
come to grips with those two assumptions and, and rethought them, you'll never be able to fully construct a, a spherical model of the earth. You'll, you'll come close, you'll have some creative ways of resolving it, but it's, you have to get at those fundamental uh, misconceptions. And that's you know, like when I read the book, I remember I remember that section in the book where you talked about like the they the, every, there were all of these really creative ways of understanding a thing that they couldn't understand. Yeah, you know, we if we have innate expectations about how the world works, they're all tied to your perception um, that you perceive the world in particular ways, um, and that perception is useful for survival and reproduction and, and just well-being more generally. Um, I mean, I think the, the, a great example is heat, that um, we think that when we touch something, we are perceiving its heat, or maybe we think that we're perceiving its temperature if you've actually differentiated heat from temperature, but it's actually uh, much more subjective than that. Our perception is heat transfer, um, how quickly heat is uh, moving between us and the environment. And so if heat is leaving very quickly, it will feel cold. Or if it's coming in very quickly, it'll feel like it's a burning sensation. Um, but that's, that's what can lead to these um, misconceptions that in an oven, right, the temperature, uh, uh, we think that, say, like the metal pan in the oven um, is at a much higher temperature, has much more heat than the air surrounding the pan, when in fact they're at the same temperature. The, the air in there is 450 degrees just like the pan is, but it's the um, air is, uh, is not a, a conductor in the way that the metal pan is, right? So the, the, the heat transfer is, is more quick, more rapid than the air. There is no way for us to perceive heat. We don't have receptors, any kind of sensory receptors for actually perceiving heat. We only have a, a means of perceiving heat transfer, you know, specifically to our bodies. So uh, you have to, to make a, a distinction between your own thermal experiences of the world and, uh, you know, the, the, tr the thermodynamics as it actually exists independent of you. Um, so I think that's... That, that kind of uh, dis distinction that um, is going to happen all over the place in lots of different domains, um, that the intuitive theories are constructed with you as the reference point, um, but the scientific theory doesn't have you in it. <laughs> uh, Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate this chat. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Like I said, I'm excited to, to connect what you're doing to what I'm doing and, and and really kind of show my audience that like, look, this is everywhere. It's not just in your, you know, it's not just in one little area. It's like, it's happening around us and we have to be vigilant to, to our own, you know, like incorrect assumptions. Right. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting for me to think about these connections. Uh, I feel hesitant to talk beyond conceptual representations, but I think you're right. I think that's all the same, the same dynamics are playing out in terms of your social relationships and, and your, um, uh, you know, wants and desires and so forth. That difference between an intuitive theory and a scientific theory being qualitative, not quantitative, is a very important part of the whole idea of recovering yourself. When you revert to your intuitive understandings of the world because you're triggered for some reason, you're probably making a poor judgment. And in a society that is uncomfortable being ambiguous, you're most likely going to plow ahead anyway. And all the while, under slightly different circumstances, you'd probably be making a very different decision. It's also an interesting point that the scientific theory doesn't have you as part of the equation. And if we are to recover ourselves completely, we have to get to a place where we can observe the world from a place where we, like the scientific theories we spoke about today, are not part of the theory. This means if our intuitive theories of right and wrong get in the way of us seeing clearly, we will not be able to address the situation we find ourselves in correctly. Throughout this conversation, you've heard Andrew address two aspects of seeing things, the scientific view and the intuitive view. For our purposes, we want to look at the intuitive theory as being akin to the beliefs or perceptions we carry about ourselves and others. For many of us, this may be the only way we see the world because so few of us have ever been taught that how we see the world is actually wrong. The scientific view that Andrew is speaking about can easily be seen as a sober view of what we're experiencing. When we are calm and have no attachment to something, we can easily allow it to happen. 
We can sit in traffic for hours if we're in good company or have good conversation, but the minute we get antsy, that can change very quickly. Same situation, different mindset. After hearing that there is always going to be conflict between our intuitive theories and more accurate ones, even though I disagree with this due to its always never stance, I know I have to continue questioning myself, especially when I'm feeling triggered. It is a great reminder and a worthy use of my energy and attention. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I had making it. And as always, I trust it is giving you something to contemplate as you go throughout your day. To learn more about Andrew and his work, pick up Science Blind or check out the links in the description of this episode for more information. Please rate and review this podcast wherever you listen and leaving comments for this episode helps me better create content. I also want you to consider supporting the show at anchor.fm or me and my work at large on Patreon where you will get access to unedited content as well as writings and one-on-one access to supporter group portrait sessions with me. I host workshops regularly and take a limited number of one-on-one clients every month. So contact me at martinjohn.com when you're ready to work together. Thank you for listening to the Recover Yourself podcast. And until next time, keep recovering yourself.